I'll read Genesis chapter 9. Or I'll actually start from chapter 8. I'll read the last two verses of chapter 8. Then I'll read chapter 9. Then we will share. So... So starting from the last from last two verses of chapter 8, which is chapter 8, verse 20. It says, I know I built... Sorry, let me switch translations. And Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar the lord smelled the play the pleasing aroma and the lord said to himself i will never again curse the ground because of man for the intent of man's heart is wicked from his youth i will never again destroy every living thing as i have done while the earth remains seed time and harvest cold and heat winter and summer and day and night shall not cease and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and the terror of you shall be in every animal of the land and in every bird of the air, and together with everything that moves on the ground and with all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I give you everything as I gave you the gr green plants and vegetables. But you shall not eat meat along with its life, that is, its blood. For your life blood, I will mostly require an accounting. From every animal that kills a person, I will require it. And from man, from, from every man's brother, that is, anyone who murders, I will require the life of man. Whosoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. As for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and, and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I am establishing my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and the wild animals of the earth along with you, of everything that comes out of the ark, every living creature of the earth, I will establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. Nor shall there ever again be a flood to destroy and ruin the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all generations. I set my rainbow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I bring clouds over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the clouds. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again will the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the rainbow is in the clouds and I look at it, I will remember the everlasting covenant between God <clears throat> and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the symbol, this rainbow is the sign of the covenant, which I have established between me and all living things of the earth. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. Ham would become the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and from these men, the whole earth was populated and scattered with inhabitants. And Noah began to farm and cultivate the ground, and he planted a vineyard. He drank some of the wine and became drunk, and he was uncovered and lay exposed in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. So Shem and Japheth took a robe and put it on their shoulders and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his younger son, had done to him. So he said, Curse be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. He also said, Bless be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth 
and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So let us pray before we get into the text. Father, we just thank you. We appreciate you for, once again, another opportunity to come before your your feet to learn from you. We thank you for the privilege of having your word, that you didn't leave us confused. You gave us your word so we understand you. We're very grateful for everyone that is going to speak. We ask that you speak through us and let your voice be heard at the end of this study. Let us have a better understanding of you and your ways. We pray that everyone who comes will be touched, will receive a word in season for their situation. Open the eyes of our understanding. And for in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, like I said, this is our Bible study where we take uh, one chapter of the Bible every day. Uh, we started from Genesis 1. I mean, if anyone has, if you want to listen to any of the replays, they are not very long. They are like 30, 30 minutes um tops minus the reading of scripture so you can start from genesis 1 anyways so right now we're in genesis 9 i actually took from verse 20 of genesis 8 together with genesis 9 because it's related so noah had just come out of the ark and the bible says and noah builded an altar unto the lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar and the Lord smelled a sweet savour, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every th living thing as I have done. So this is what is called the Noachic covenant or the covenant of Noah. So the way God operates with man, right? He operates in three levels or three dimensions. The basic level is, is a promise, right? He gives man promises. Then when he wants to strengthen the promise, he changes the promise into a covenant. Then when he wants to strengthen the covenant, he swears an oath. So it starts from a promise, then to a covenant, then to an oath. And we can see this, and the deeper it gets, the more affirmed what god said is the more established it is the more unchangeable it is and we can see this with abraham right when god first called him in genesis 12 he gave him a promise get thee out of your country from your kindred so he landed i will show you and i will bless you i'll make you a great nation and we knew all the families of the earth will be blessed whoever blesses you will be blessed whoever curses you will be cursed it was just a promise but in genesis 15 right, the lord appeared to abraham and told him to get some animals and abraham cut the animals and the lord passed through the animals in the shape of a burning flask right and the, a flaming torch at that point it was no longer a promise it was now a covenant he now says unto you i make this covenant with you and to your seed forever to give you the land wherein you now dwell that's genesis 15. but if you get down to genesis 22 after god um asked abraham to sacrifice his son and Abraham agreed. He now says, I swear by myself that in blessing will I bless you and in multiplying will I multiply. So it migrated from promise to covenant to oath. And with every level, what God is saying becomes more and more established. So this is the Noachic covenant. And for covenants to be established, God doesn't just throw around covenants. There has to be obedience and sacrifice there had to be a high level of sacrifice before a covenant is enacted right so god will first deal like abraham he says go he has to go into the land god didn't just come and enter into make a covenant with him so he had to sacrifice his his father's house his kindred where he was staying he had to travel he had to get to the land so after to get into the land staying there for by this time, it was over 10 years. It was if he had sacrificed everything he had at the time. He hadn't gotten Isaac. So when God saw that sacrifice, God came and entered into a covenant with him, right? So even with Noah, it's the same thing. God first told him, um, he will save him. Go ahead, that's the promise. So save you, save your household, but build an ark and get into it. So there's a lot of sacrifice that goes with building a 450 foot long 75 foot high 30 foot in breadth arc 
right? It have taken him years. There are no machines, right? So building it, plus people would have been mocking him. People would have been scorning him. They would have thought it was crazy, right? He gets into the ark. He's not comfortable. He's there for over a year inside a dark boat because the way he built it, he had to cover the boat. It's not like now boats of nowadays where when you're when you're inside, you can see the sky. He couldn't leave it open because if he left it open, the rain will fall into the boat. So he has to cover. He has, it's like a building. So he has covered the boat on top. So it's dark apart from lights that he has inside. He's there with a bunch of smelly animals. They are pooping everywhere, peeing everywhere. The dog is barking. The cow is mooing. Right, the lions and the tigers are roaring. It's, it's very uncomfortable. The place is smelly. The waves are pushing the boats from left to right, from left to right, and he's there for over an entire year. Then he comes down. Everybody he knows is dead. His friends are dead. His colleagues are dead. There are dead corpses everywhere. Animals dead. Animals everywhere. The earth, the whole structure of the earth, is changed. So he comes down, and it's, it's not it's not a rosy situation. Even though he survived, right. So he took a high level of sacrifice for Noah to do all that. So when he came down, right, you can even see his dedication to God. Most of us, when you come down, the first thing you build is a house. When Noah came down, he built an altar. He didn't build a house. He didn't even plant food. So he came down. The next thing we see is that Noah built an altar onto the Lord. So you can see the level of dedication. So based on that sacrifice that Noah did, the Bible says God smelt the savor of the sacrifice. So it's not just that he born, he killed some animals and God was happy. If you kill animals while disobeying God, God will not take it because Saul tried it. He killed animals and God didn't take it because obedience is better than sacrifice. So the real sacrifice that Noah made was his life. It wasn't, it was the obedience, the sacrifice of building the ark. It wasn't just the animals he offered when he came down. So he came down, he killed the animals, God smelled the aroma, right? Plus his obedience and God now made him a couple of promises. This is what is called the Noahic covenant. So God first says, I will never again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, though the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. That's the first promise. I'll be the first part of the Noahic covenant. Then he says, neither again will I smite any more everything living as I have done. That's the second covenant. The third one, he now says, while the earth remaineth, Seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. So let me explain this three before I get to the last one. So he first says, I will never again smite the curse the ground for man's sake, right? For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. So when Adam sinned, God cursed the ground. He said, Cursed is the ground for your sake. He said, Thorns and thistles will he bring up for you. He now says, By the sweat of your brow thou shalt eat bread. So the ground we walk on is not the ground God created. The ground God created was exceedingly fruitful, was easy to plant crops, right? The crops even survived without the sun. If you study the creation story, nowadays you need sunlight to farm. But in the creation story, right, the crops were created before the sun and they had grown and the fruits were already there before God created the sun. So the, the ground was far more fruitful and it was it yielded its strength to men. We didn't, they didn't have to labor so hard. It didn't bring up thorns and thistles and grass and weed and drought and all these things. But because man sinned, God cursed the ground and the composition of, of the ground changed. So God is making no I promise. And he says that, because of your obedience, I will not curse the ground, even though I know that man is very stubborn, even though I know that they will continue to sin. But because of what you have done, I will make sure the ground is never cursed again. Then he makes him, he makes him another promise, right? Part of the, the Noachic covenant. He now says, neither again will I smite anymore every living thing as I have done. So he says, because of you, I will no longer destroy every living thing the way I just destroyed every living thing. So, you know, Sometimes you see the level of wickedness in the world. And I've, I've asked God this thing so many times. You hear some strange stories of like people being raped, of child sacrifice, of, I mean, ritual killings. There's so much wickedness, so much iniquity. And I, I'm sometimes I ask God, I'm like, God, how are you money? I like, I literally ask him like, how are you managing this thing? How can you be seeing all this sin? I am not doing anything. If it was me, I'll probably have just wiped everybody out right and i'm like how because i'm a man and i'm not as righteous as god it's not even the can't even compare but when i see some some level of iniquity 
it hurts me. I'm like, it's, I'm so disgusted. And I'm like, if a, a, a man like me that is not as righteous as God, is not even anywhere near him, can be this disgusted, how is God managed? Until I saw this, where God promised Noah that because of you, I will no longer kill everybody on earth. And I'm like, wow, wow. Then the third thing he said, he now said, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease, right? Because, you know, during the flood, all these things ceased. There was no seed time and harvest. The rain fell for 40 days straight. After 40 days straight, the Bible says the water prevailed upon the earth for 150 days. So, for at a minimum of 290 days, you could not plant anything. There was nothing like seed time and harvest. There was water everywhere. And it was close to a year before the, the water dried completely. So, there was nothing like seed time and harvest. There was no cold and heat. It was water. There was nothing like cold, nothing like heat. It was constant rain from the, the fountains of, of the great deep. That means from under the earth, rain was coming, water was coming out. And from on top, water was coming out. Then he now says summer and winter. There was also nothing like summer and winter. It was rain forever. Constant rain. There was no change in seasons. And he says day and night shall not sit. It was only day. This one, you have to receive it by faith. I'm, I'm not going to explain it. You just have to receive it by faith. But during the time of Noah, it was only during the time of the, the flood, the 150 days, it was only day. There was no night. And God now promised Noah that because you have done this, I will never interfere in the earth to the point where sea time and harvest will fail, cold and heat will fail, summer and winter will fail, and day and night will cease. Then he now make when he gets to verse chapter eight, chapter nine, he now makes him another promise that he will never send a flood again. So there are four promises. He will not curse the ground. He will no more kill everybody. While the earth remaineth, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter and day and night will not cease. And that he will never send a flood to destroy everybody. And I'm like, what a legacy for a man to have. This is Noah's legacy. That when a man left the earth, this is what he left for us. Truly speaking, this is what this guy left for us. Because of him, God will never curse the ground. What a life. Because of him, God will not kill everybody. So people are enjoying mercy now because of Noah. Because of him, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, day and night will not cease because of Noah. Because of Noah, God will never flood the earth again. I'm like, what a man, what a life. So meanwhile, some people are here, all their life is money, chasing after money, laboring for cars, laboring for houses. It's a waste. It's a complete waste. See what this guy left on earth. If you labor for a car, labor for a house, you don't work for God, that car will turn to dust. The house will turn to dust. Any company you build, it will, it will eventually crash. But see this man's legacy. What a life of impact. People don't even know him. Many people, apart from us Christians, we don't know him. And the ones that know him, there are people who think everybody lives in the old in the old testament they were just daft they didn't see jesus so we that saw jesus were more important than them but ask these people that think this thing they are not doing anything for god one soul they have never won one soul they have not they are not doing anything for god's kingdom but look at the, the life that a man lived that the whole earth is blessed because of him the and god entered into the covenant not even just with him even with the animals he says, Behold, this is my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl, of the cattle, of every beast of the earth. So even the beasts of the earth, God entered a covenant with them because of Noah. The reason that God has not even killed animals together is because of Noah. What a life of impact. Amazing. Amazing. That one man's life has touched the entirety of creation, both man and beast and the earth. It is amazing. So I'm going to, I just want you to be asking yourself, you that you are living your life now, what, what are you going to live on this earth by the time you live? That when God looks down on the earth, God will say, this is what this person did for me. This is what this person did for me. Because if you leave a house, leave a car, that's what God doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't stay in houses, he doesn't drive cars. And cars and houses don't contribute to the kingdom of God. Anyways, chapter 9. God said, let me start from verse 3. He says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. So before this, men didn't used to eat animals. So if you read Genesis chapter 1, right, when God created Adam, he didn't tell him to eat animals. Let me quickly open Genesis 1. A minute. So Genesis 1, right, 
after God created man. I'm scrolling down. So Genesis 1, 29. And God said, Behold, I have given... Listen very carefully what God gave them to eat. Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. So God gave them three things to eat. The herb, the tree, and the fruit of a tree. So both the man and the beasts were not eating beasts. So the man ate only crops, right? And the beast also ate only crops. That's how come Noah could put a lion and a tiger in the same ark and they didn't eat the cows and the goats because they didn't used to eat each other. They only ate crops. But after the ark, right, when they came out, because of sin, the whole the whole constitution of, of creation was changed. So God now gave them permission to eat meat. He now says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Every living thing that moveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. So he says, even as I gave you, you the herb, the trees, the crops, the plants to be eaten, now you can eat anything. But he now gave them a warning. He now said, but the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. So he told them, you can now eat meat, but don't eat meat that has the blood. So this is not to say that if you, have, that if you eat meat, you are a sinner. Or that veget being a vegetarian is more spiritual than eating meat. There's nothing like that. Nowhere in the scriptures we can eat. And God himself gave us permission that you can eat anything you want to eat. Right? So I'm just highlighting how the earth changed because of sin. And I'm explaining the scriptures. I'm not insinuating that being a vegetarian is better than eating meat. Or eating meat is better than being a vegetarian. Or one is more spiritual than the other. I'm just explaining the scriptures because that's what it is. So... He now gives them a warning. He says, But the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. So he's letting us know that the flesh of the blood is the life of everything that has flesh. The blood is the life force. I don't want to use the word life force because it's a, it's, a, it's a witchcraft term, to be honest. But the life of every being is in the blood. So that's what God is explaining to them. And since the life is in the blood, you can't eat the blood. Then he now goes on in verse 5 and he says, Surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast I will require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of a man. Whoso shedded man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. So he's explaining what will happen when people decide to kill each other. He now says, the blood of your lives I will require. That means I will ask you for it. He says, at the hand of every beast, I will require it. So God says, if a lion kills a man, he will ask the lion for the life of that man. He says, at the hand of every beast, will I require it? And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of a man? He now says, whoso shed a man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So, when somebody kills another person that is innocent, right? The person's blood cries to God because blood is life. You can speak. When you sin, what speaks for you is the blood of Jesus. You know that prayer when we say we plead the blood, we plead the blood. It's not a joke. What you actually you are begging the blood of Jesus to beg for you. So the blood of Jesus is what speaks and asks God to have mercy upon you. So blood speaks. So when somebody kills somebody that is innocent. That person's blood cries to God. Blood has a voice. And when the blood cries to God, God will not require the blood from the man that killed him. God will not ask the man, why did you kill him? And God will ask for <laughs> judgment for that innocent blood. That's what happened when Cain killed Abel. The Bible says God came to Cain and said, the voice of your brother's blood cried out unto me from the ground, which had opened her mouth to swallow it up. So he killed Abel. It wasn't Abel that cried. It was Abel's blood. And because he killed Abel, God came to ask him for Abel's blood. And Cain, 
instinctively knew that because he killed somebody, someone will kill him. That's what he told God. Because now we're just understanding the spiritual mechanics. Because the Bible says, whosoever shedded man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. But Cain instinctively knew this, even before the scripture was given. So when he killed Abel and God came to him, he already he was already complaining that someone is going to kill me. And that's why God put a mark on Cain, so nobody kills him. And this scripture is littered, this concept of you kill somebody, someone comes to kill you, is littered over, all over scripture, right? And the only thing that can stop it is God's mercy. The only thing that can intervene is God's mercy. It's like spiritually, when you kill somebody, you open the door for yourself to be killed. Truly speaking. There, when, when you sin, right? The Bible doesn't teach that you inherit the exact sin that you sinned. The principle is basically you sow iniquity, you reap iniquity. So it says, he that swear to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. So it's not like if you lie, somebody will lie to you. Or if you cheat, someone will cheat you. Or if you steal, someone will steal from you. Because let's say you are working from some, for somebody and you run down, you steal from the person's business, right? If you don't open a business, nobody can come and steal from you. So you can't, you wouldn't be able to reap exactly what you sowed, but somehow, somehow, the iniquity you sowed must come back to you. So the general principle is those that sow to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. It's not like if you lie, someone will lie, or if you rape someone, someone will rape you. But God says when you shed blood, you have authorized your own blood to be shed. And it's only by mercy that that process can be stopped. If when we continue reading and we get into the law, we will get into the revenge of blood and how when people kill, the only way they can be stopped from being killed is when they hold on to the altar. We'll get to it's a spiritual principle, but it's laid out physically. So there are other scriptures that talk about when somebody kills, they should all, they will also be killed. I don't. There are many in the Old Testament, but I'm not going to read them. I'll read the ones from the New Testament. So Matthew 26 verse 52 this is peter peter so they came to arrest jesus peter now put his hand inside his pocket or whatever brought out a knife cut somebody's ear then look at what jesus told him matthew 26 52 he says put your sword back in its place jesus said to him for all who draw the sword will die by the sword jesus told him that if you draw the sword you will die by the sword another scripture in the new testament revelation 13 verse 10 he says, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. That's what the Bible teaches. An abortion is, is shedding innocent blood, by the way. Let's just throw it in, right? Because it's, there's nobody that is more innocent than a child. So anybody who sheds the blood of a child, I don't know. But in case you've done it, right, the Bible says that the blood of Jesus speaketh better things or stronger things than the blood of Abel. So Abel was an innocent man. When he, when they killed him, his blood was crying for judgment. And the Bible lets us know that the blood of Jesus speaketh stronger things than the blood of even an innocent man or an innocent child. So in case you've done it, the blood of Jesus covers that sin. As long as you've come to God in repentance, the blood of Jesus is speaketh better things, stronger things. Is it has more weight in the spirit. And mercy rejoiced over judgment. So, but please don't do it again because it is innocent blood. So, scrolling down to verse 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole world populated. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and was drunken, and uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren outside. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, that they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So this is the last part of the scripture. This is the last thing we're going to discuss before we close. So, the Bible talks about the three sons of Noah. He had three sons. One was named Shem, one was named Ham, one was named Japheth. So that after they came out from the ark, 
The Bible says Noah plant, planted a vineyard or a vineyard, depending on how you pronounce it. And he drank of the wine of the vineyard and he became drunk and he uncovered himself within his tent. So the Bible says that Ham saw the nakedness of his father and then went and told his two brothers that were outside. Then Shem and Japheth, they took a robe and came in backward, like with their backs, and covered the nakedness of their father. They didn't want to see their father's nakedness. So Noah woke up from his wine or his drunken stupor, and then he said, Cursed be Canaan, this is Ham's son, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. So Ham did something that was not right to Noah, right? Noah got up and cursed his son. He said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. So if you read the story of the Bible, right, you see how this curse came into play. So Canaan or the Canaanites, they became a servant to Shem. So he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So Shem is the father of Abraham. Shem is the father of Eba, which is the father of Abraham, right? He's, he's not direct father, but their ancestors. And Abraham is the father of the Israelites. So he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, that's the Israelites, and Canaan shall be his servant. So if you study the scriptures, right, you see how they later really became the servants of the Israelites. So it's not, it's not all of them that they killed when they took the land of Canaan. There are many times, if you study the book of Kings, right, they were actually their slaves. They took them as slaves. They dwelt in the land with them. They didn't kill all of them. And they used them as servants to chop down firewood, to fetch water. They were literally slaves. Even until the time of the New Testament, there were still some Canaanites who were slaves in the land of Israel. So Noah got up, right? Maybe he was angry because of what had happened to him. And he just uttered the word, curse be Canaan. And it cursed him down to his generations. So, if you study the Old Testament, right, there were men who walked with God to the point where they had so much power that almost when they say anything, it just happens. So, for instance, like Elijah, right, people came to arrest him. And he didn't, he just said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven. He didn't, he didn't, that was not like a prayer, like God sent down fire. He just said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven. And fire came down and killed them. He just said it casually. The Bible says that in the days of Ahab, when there was a, a famine, Elijah came and said, there will not be rain for three and a half years. He didn't say, God told me there will not be rain. He says, according to my word, there will be no rain. So is he that said it. He had that much authority. He said, according to my word, there will be no rain. Then after three years, he came back and said, by this time tomorrow, it was his word. The Bible talks about Moses. How he, he this, the, is it the Kohatites or some, I can't remember who. They spoke against Moses in the wilderness. And Moses said, if I be a man of God, let the earth open up and swallow you. And as he said it, the earth opened and swallowed them. Life alive. So, some people are wondering why, even though the Bible says decree a thing, it should not be established. They decree some things and it doesn't work. The reason is, God will not give you that kind of authority. Because He give, if he gives you that kind of authority, and you haven't learned to bridle your tongue, you use that authority to destroy yourself. So you see people, they make some kind of strange proclamations over their own life. And if you had the authority of Moses, where if you said something, it will actually happen. You will be shocked how you it is you that will ruin your life. So someone just, maybe something just happened. He just lost some money. He just said, hey, Mugui, my life is finished. His life will actually be finished. Someone is going through challenges. He just says, kai, kai, kai. My life is very hard. As he utters it, his life will be hard. Someone is going through relationship issues. He just says, I will never find a good man. And as she utters it, she will truly never find a good man. Somebody, let's say he really has authority like Elijah. He's in his country. Something bad just happens in his country. He just says this country will never be good. As he utters it, that's how he would he would destroy his country for himself, destroy it for his children, destroy it for his children's children, and even destroy it for innocent people that didn't even know what was going on. Someone is working on a job. He doesn't like the way things are going. He just opens his mouth and says, This job safe. 
it's like i will soon leave it they will sack the, as he says it he'll be shocked that in two weeks time they will actually sack him they will actually sack him so you may not have authority over a nation like elijah you may not have authority over the ground like moses but everybody has authority over his own life truly speaking you are the prophet of your life and death and life is in power of the tongue so if you open your mouth and speak anyhow you will be surprised that you will repeat you will be very he says death and light life is in the power of the tongue he says they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof so whether you like it or not the fruit of whatever you've been prophesying over yourself will come to pass so if you check your life right probably where you are now is a product of what you said five years ago people will just say oh this, this life is hard oh things are not good things are not working oh this one this one but then you're uttering all those words you are programming this guy just said he didn't talk too much cost be canaan a servant of servant shall he be unto his brethren they were cursed even unto the new testament by this time eh, this is this is noah abraham has not even been born check how many years truly speaking people just their children just annoy them they just look at the child says see this foolish child see this useless child they just say say anything why is this child giving me problem you why are you stubborn like this this child you're not the one that will kill me <laughs> why just, they just open their mouth people even cost their own spouses you just because someone's husband did not behave well just open your mouth and say see this useless man see this my good for nothing wife <laughs> now uh, may, may the lord have mercy upon us so if you've said any of those things concerning yourself, if you've cost yourself, if you even cost your country, those of us who cost Nigeria, this country will never be good. This country is finished. May you, may God have mercy on you. May you repent. If you've said any of those things over yourself, over your children, over your spouses, over your job, you need to be very careful. If things are not going well on your job, you need to be careful the kind of programmations. Because someone will say, this job, I'll soon leave it. When you say, I'll soon leave it, you didn't specify how you leave it. They can sack you. Truly speaking, as you you have the one that opened the door for that sack letter, you will just be surprised that trouble will start coming from different places. You're having trouble with your finances. You just you don't just say life are hard. Life is hard. You know what the Bible says? It says, let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. It doesn't say let the weak say I'm going to die of sickness. So when you are sick, you don't say, kai kai, this sickness will kill me. No. It says, let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. So it's not, we are not... <laughs> This thing is not, it's not fantasy, it's in the Bible. You, you proclaim what God's word says. They sent 10 spies to, to go and check out the land of Canaan. 10 of them came back and said, we cannot take the land. They died in the wilderness. As they said, it happened to them. Two said, we will take it. And they took it. So you, you need to be very careful what you speak. So if you've spoken any of those words over your life unknowingly out of anger, out of pain, sometimes out of pain, you, the reaction to whatever that is financial hardship, relationship, you just spoke all those things. It's not too late. You can cancel it. You can say, you can go in the place of prayer and say, God, all those things I said, I take them back. I cancel those words. And then you proclaim God's word. You proclaim what you want to see. It says the poor, they say I am rich. And the weak, they say I am strong. <laughs> 